Sorry. So we're very happy to have Kristen Lauder here um, to give her third and final lecture on super singular isogeny graphs and cryptography. Thanks, Jen. And let me take this opportunity to thank the organizers. A thank you to Akshay, Bjorn, and Jen, and also to the organizers of PCMI. Organizing these conferences and summer schools is a lot of work, and I really appreciate everything you've done and the chance to talk to all of you here. So, um, so for my third lecture, if you remember um, at the end of the second lecture, we started to talk about the quaternion algebras and the specifically the quaternion interpretation of the super singular isogeny graph. So just to recall, the idea is, is that for a super singular elliptic curve, if you um, associate to it its endomorphism ring, which is a maximal order in a quaternion algebra, um, you get a, a different graph, which is instead of elliptic curves with isogenies, you have um, a graph where the vertices are maximal orders in this quaternion algebra. And this during correspondence is something that I wanted to explain in more detail. But I first needed to start by explaining a little bit about quaternion algebras, which is what we started last time. So the quaternion algebras that we'll be working in are quaternion algebras over Q, the rationals, they're uh, rank four, um, vector space over Q. And um, we in particular are interested in definite quaternion algebras, which um, are ramified only at P and infinity. And so I started to tell you how we describe and work with these um, algebras BP infinity last time. So we're going to take a basis, one I, J, K, and um, the, it will always be of the form I squared is equal to A, J squared is equal to B, and K is equal to I, J, which is minus J, I, where in general, A and B are negative um, integers. And in particular, for example, if P is congruent to three mod four, then A, B can be taken to be minus P minus one. And so for other congruence classes of P, there's other descriptions uh, of A and B, uh, but I didn't write them down here. Okay, so then the next thing that we need to know is, is that we have a norm form on this quaternion algebra. Um, there's a little bit of confusion because in the quaternionic setting, we usually talk about the norm, well, norm and trace actually as reduced norm and reduced trace, but throughout the literature in this area, you'll see it just referred to as norm. So don't be confused by that. Um, strictly speaking, we would call it the reduced norm, but throughout this, I'm just gonna use the term norm, which is what everybody says in like for shorthand. So, um, we get the norm by realizing that, first of all, we have an involution on the quaternion algebra, which sends an element which is written in terms of the basis um, one i, j, k to um, basically just negating the i, j, and k coefficients. So I'll call that uh, x star. So for example, um, if, if it's, the element, if X is the element C plus DJ plus FI plus GIJ, then the involution would just be C minus DJ minus FI minus GIJ. Um, and then um, we have a reduced trace and a reduced norm um, on, in the space. And that is that the, the reduced trace just takes x plus x star and the norm just takes x minus x star. So for example, with the basis that I had written um, when on the previous slide, when p is congruent to three mod four, then the um, norm map is just, it takes an element that's written in terms of this basis to the element c squared plus d squared plus p times f squared plus g squared. Um, so one thing that you should notice, which is really important in um, a lot of other work that I've done in my life, is, is that um, P is really large in the cryptographic setting. 
So if you look at this norm form, it's um, you know just c squared plus d squared plus p times f squared plus g squared. So if if even if c, d, f, and g are all really small, this norm is going to be really large if um, if f and g are not zero, right? So what happens is that um, elements of small norm uh, commute essentially. So what the, what it means is is that if you have a norm, an element whose norm is very small compared to p, then it means it has no component from the f and g are zero, and that means that um, the the element itself is just uh, an element of a quadratic subfield of the quaternion algebra. So that's just kind of an interesting side fact that I always like to point out. Um, so <clears throat> another thing that's going to be very important um, for the during correspondence and for the for the relationship between um, the quaternionic side and the elliptic curve side is that the norm map on quaternions corresponds to the degree map on endomorphisms. So I will um, uh, explain this a little better uh, in the setting of the during correspondence when we go back to that. So first of all, I think one of the issues is there's a lot, there's actually a lot of terminology and a lot of definitions to know and to learn for quaternion algebras. And I can't cover all of them uh, here today, but just to give you uh, an idea to start with. Um, so we say a, frac a fractional ideal in the quaternions is actually a rank four Z lattice. So I've written it as um, this um, kind of curly I is going to be the notation for my ideals here. Um, so it's a, a rank four Z lattice. So it means it's, it's written uh, in the form like alpha one Z plus alpha two Z plus alpha three Z plus alpha four Z, where alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, alpha four, form, they actually form a basis, a Q basis for BP infinity. Um, so that's what a fractional ideal is. Um, but the fact is that a, um, the fractional ideal is not necessarily a, an actually a subring of the quaternion algebra. And so we say an order O is a fractional ideal, which is also a subring. So it's closed under multiplication. And I, I didn't write all this down, but like a, a maximal order is one that's not contained in any other larger order. Um, the norm of an ideal is gonna be the Z module generated by reduced norms of elements in the ideal. So uh, another kind of important fact, which is very different from the commutative case is that, um, and you can actually, you know, try to come up with an example of this yourself. Integral, so integral elements do not necessarily form a ring. So we have the nice situation like in number fields that if you take the integral elements, uh, you get the ring of integers of the ring. And that is not tr necessarily true in the quaternionic case. So integral element is, um, it's reduced norm and trace are in Z. So it's kind of the same uh, definition as in the commutative case, but um, we don't have the same property of the integral elements being closed. Um, Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about a very important concept, which is the right order of a fractional ideal. So if you have a fractional ideal I, this curly, curly I, um, the right order will be all of the elements in the quaternion algebra BP infinity, such that if you multiply on the right, uh, if you multiply the ideal on the right by that element alpha, you still get another element in the ideal. So that's that's the right order. And then I didn't write it down, but the left order. So I'll use the notation O sub R for the right order and O sub L for the left order. The left order would be all the elements such that, uh, at such all the elements alpha such that if you multiply on the left by alpha, you would still be in the ideal. 
So um, now we come to another very important concept, which is called the connecting ideal. So given two maximal orders, um, O1 and O2, the connecting ideal is an ideal which has the property that its um, right ideal is O1 and its left ideal is O2. So there is a, a kind of a linear algebra type of procedure for computing a connecting ideal, which was, as far as I know, first written in a paper of Kirschmer, Kirschmer and Voigt in 2008. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that it was known before that. It was known, for example, to David Cole. And I think it might have even been implemented by David Cole and Magma before that. I'm not completely certain um, about that. But in the, the kind of quaternion algebra package that um, David wrote in Magma, I think he might have even already had the connecting ideal in there. Um, I should I should have said at the beginning of the quaternionic uh, algebra, quaternion algebra section that kind of the the Bible for quaternion algebras is a book by Marie France Vigneras and from the from the eighties I think and so that's where I learned quaternion algebras from and it's it's written in French and it's very uh, well written and complete um, but uh, recently. People have written things in English that may be a little bit easier to read. Um, so John Voigt um, has a book uh, with a lot of that material and a lot of other things and a lot of al algorithms. Uh, but also um, there's a couple of references which I can, um, I can share later. I don't think I have them on my slides, but uh, which give very nice overview. So there were some lectures by uh, by Pete Clark that I found that are in, in English that have a really nice description, quaternion algebra background. Okay, so with some of that uh, background in mind, and keep in mind, I is this not a complete you know course on on quaternion algebras here, uh, just to give you kind of the basic uh, building blocks. Uh, let's go back to what I mentioned at the end of the lecture last time, which is the during correspondence. So uh, a super singular J invariant on the elliptic curve side would now be uh, associated with a maximal order in a quaternion algebra on the other side. Um, and so how, what is this correspondence? How will it work? So a left ideal of O uh, will be, will correspond to an isogeny then as follows. Uh, the isogeny, call it phi sub I, will go from the elliptic curve E to an elliptic curve we'll call E sub I, um, and it'll be defined by its kernel and the kernel is going to be all of the points P on the elliptic curve, which are basically annihilated by the ideal. So such that every element of the ideal, um, and remember, this is these are elements which are essentially endomorphisms of the elliptic curve. Uh, every uh, alpha in the ideal takes the point to zero uh, so for all points that that's true, um, they're annihilated by all the elements of the ideal, those will be the points in the kernel that's associated to I. So that's, this is in theory what the, um, what the correspondence would be. Now the problem is actually being able to do this in practice, to be able to kind of construct the order which is the endomorphism ring of the elliptic curve in a, in a constructive way so that you could actually evaluate endomorphisms and see which points are annihilated. That's what you would need to do in order to be able to say what this actual isogeny is in practice. Um, so the during correspondence is a one-to-one -one correspondence if the degree is co-prime, the degree of the isogeny is co-prime to P. In other words, this is a separable isogeny determined by its kernel. And then um, if you take this ideal, which the, the left ideal I, which it corresponds to an isogeny, the right order of this ideal would then be the endomorphism ring of the kind of target elliptic curve. 
So now what we've done is, at least in theory, we've built up this other graph, which is the kind of the same graph as the supersingular isogeny graph described in terms of elliptic curves. It's just that the elliptic curves are the maximal orders, and then the isogenies are these left ideals whose right ideals are the next maximal order or the next vertex in the, in the quaternion graph. So uh, let's go back to an example. So sticking with the P congruent to three mod four, where I gave you uh, a um, specific description of BP infinity and looking at the elliptic curve E zero, which is uh, Y squared equals X Q plus X, which is super singular for such P um, and has J invariant uh, 1728. Um, the endomorphism ring of E0 is a particular maximal order, which we're going to call it O0. So throughout the rest of this talk, O0 is actually going to be this O0. Um, so for the algorithms that I'm going to describe, we're working in this situation where P is 3 mod 4, and this is the um, what's often called a special extremal um, maximal order, O0. So if you, I'm not sure if you already started on this in the exercises today, but if you're using magma or sage, you can actually specify P, you can specify a quaternion algebra, and then you can even just ask for all the maximal orders and it will compute them, at least for small p. Um, it will also, if you give it a maximal order, it should also give you all of the left ideals of that maximal order. And then what you could do is you could actually ask for each of those left ideals, you could ask for the right order of those ideals, and then you'll um, get all the kind of neighbors uh, of the, of the uh, order that you started with. Um, okay, oh, I'm sorry, I realized I forgot a kind of an important point. In the elliptic curve graph, on the elliptic curve side, uh, we restrict to L isogenies for L equal to some prime, which is usually very small, like two or three. And the, um, the prime P is extremely large, like of cryptographic size. So on the quaternion side, if we wanna build up the, the, that, sa the, that same graph, what we need to do is we need to restrict to um, uh, ideals of norm L. So that's the an analog of the degree L isogeny. So, uh, but one of the things that I think is, causes a little bit of confusion in this area, um, and we tried to, we tried to clarify this um, in our in our Eurocrypt paper in um, 2018 uh, with Eisentrager, Halgren, Morrison, and Petit, um, is that you can talk about an endomorphism ring of an elliptic curve in a lot of different ways. So right now I'm talking about it as being a, a maximal order in a quaternion algebra. So I I, I wrote down this O zero equals Z, you know, the Z module um, generated by these four elements here, one I, one plus K over two and I plus J over two. But the fact is, is that like that, that might not be all that helpful for actually evaluating an endomorphism on the elliptic curve. So just below that, what I'm showing you is um, an actual representation of the endomorphism ring in terms of actual endomorphisms. So I think I might have mentioned in my first lecture that um, you know we have some endomorphism. Clearly, we have the Frobenius endomorphism whenever we have an elliptic curve over a finite field. Um, and so that's described here by pi. Pi is Frobenius. And then in this case, we have this special endomorphism, which is very nice, um, phi, I guess. We Forgotten all my Greek letters here. Phi takes x y to minus x comma i y, where i squared is minus one. 
So this is an explicit description of the endomorphism ring in terms of actual endomorphisms. Um, and the way to connect it to this O0, I've kind of written, written down the map here is like, um, you know, I get sent to phi, oh, sorry, I have a different script here for phi. I get sent to phi, J gets sent to pi, K gets sent to pi phi. Okay, so this is like the best possible scenario where you have a description, you have, you know, kind of all, th all three things. You have an elliptic curve, you know what its endomorphism ring is in terms of actual maps, in terms of endomorphisms that generate a rank four Z module and how they act on the curve. And then you also know a description in terms of the quaternion algebra, which is a maximal order with its basis. And this is a beautiful setup, which gives you a lot of um, advantages in computation. But um, unfortunately, or if maybe fortunately for the security of our um, crypto systems, this is not the case for general super singular elliptic curves. So I think in the exercises you've been, uh, you've taken some, hopefully done the examples where you, you fix a prime and then you use magma or sage to generate all the super singular elliptic curves. Well, you know, one way to do that is there's a function that's implemented there. So you can just call that function, but uh, behind the scenes, it will, um, in, in the general case, it will take and use the Hilbert class polynomial for an imaginary quadratic field where P is inert. And then it will take the roots of that polynomial uh, mod P and, and, or sorry, not exactly take the roots, just factor it mod P and it'll have linear factors and quadratic factors, which correspond to the roots of those correspond to the J invariants of the super singular elliptic curves over FP and FP squared. So if you use that function or you follow that procedure and you, and you're, you got an, a super singular elliptic curve, the problem is you have no idea what its endomorphism ring is. You can use that J invariant to write down an equation of the elliptic curve, expect, except for in some very special cases of like characteristic two and three, which we're, which we're not in here. So you can take the J and very, you can get an elliptic curve. And so you'll have some model for your elliptic curve, but you have no idea what the endomorphism ring is, what the super singular elliptic, uh, the maximal order in the quaternion algebra or the, the, the rank four Z module in terms of endomorphisms. And so that's kind of um, uh, essentially the very hard problem in this area is, is that we don't know how to compute endomorphism rings. So um, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the fact is, is that if you knew how to compute endomorphism rings what, for general super singular elliptic curves, what you could do is you could pass from the elliptic curve description of the graph over to the quaternion side by replacing an elliptic curve and its J invariant with a maximal order in a quaternion algebra. And then you could apply an algorithm which we developed and published in ANTS in 2014. This was with Cole and Petit and Tignol. Um, which actually can find paths on the quaternion side. So in the quaternion, in the quaternion version of the graph, we can find, uh, find paths. So the way this works is um, given two maximal orders, O1 and O2, uh, you can find the, a connecting ideal and then um, basically at least heuristically, you can replace it with, you can find a, an L power, uh, an ideal of L power norm, which is, um, which is equivalent to the connecting ideal. Um, so I'm not giving a lot of details here. This would um, take more time to, to go into the details, but um, the connecting ideal, uh, let me just go back to this reference to Kirschmer and Voigt. Um, I haven't said exactly how to uh, compute this, but you can, com you can compute mu and n such that uh, if you have an ideal of 
of norm n such that you write the connecting ideal in this form. Um, and then once you have that connecting ideal, let's call that I, uh, you can find an equivalent norm which has um, prime, prime norm because of the following. So if alpha is an element, so step three here, if alpha is an element of I, you can replace um, the ideal I with an equivalent one, which is I times gamma, where uh, gamma is alpha star divided by N. And so in order to find an element alpha, which has prime norm, um, what we do is uh, we take the, um, the norm form that I described earlier and search through uh, all of the past. So remember an element alpha in the basis that I gave you for BP infinity is just specified by four coordinates. So you're gonna search through a box of um, four, you know, in basically Z to the fourth elements that have uh, four coordinates and you're looking for um, uh, you're looking for solutions to the norm equation such that the norm is prime. And so um, actually one way to do that is to just use Kornacha's algorithm, like you fix two of the coordinates and then you look for um, solutions uh, that will get you what you want for the other two. Um, but in general, I guess this is the part which is the heuristic part of the algorithm. Like we describe our success probability in terms of the um, heuristics for the distributions of primes. And it's just very likely that you that you will find um, an element of prime norm very quickly. And so then um, what, what we do is we use the, um, the, the uh, equivalent ideal i times gamma that I've written here. And this, so this is an ideal of prime norm. And then we use a um, kind of strong approximation technique, which I'm also not gonna describe here to find an equivalent um, ideal with L power norm. And so this corresponds to, this is a procedure um, that works for um, the OZ, for the connecting ideal between um, maximal ideal O1 and the special extremal ideal O0 that I um, described in the previous slide. And so what you do to try to get, um, to solve this problem between O1 and O2 is you do this procedure twice. So you use O0 in the middle and kind of find an L, L path back to O0 from O1 and an L path from um, back to O0 from O2, and then you concatenate them. And then that's what gives you a path from O1 to O2. So um, let me just pause here and say that, um, like, like I said, this would be very bad news for cryptography if you can actually find the um, maximal orders that are associated to elliptic curves. And um, that's because you would just take two elliptic curves, you would find their maximal orders, or find their endomorphism rings as maximal orders in the quaternion algebra. And then you would apply this algorithm, the KLPT algorithm, and you would find a, a, an ideal, which is written as a, um, it, an, an ideal which has uh, norm L to the N. And then you would take uh, that ideal and you would break it down into steps and you would find um, the path back from uh, the, the end point of your walk to the beginning. So that pulling, pulling the path back is also possible if you know both of the orders of the, of the two endpoints. But the, the problem is, so computing the endomorphism rings. And again, there's always this ambiguity when I say endomorphism rings, you could mean computing it as the maximal order in the quaternion algebra, or you could mean as computing it in terms of the, um, actual endomorphisms that you can evaluate. And even when we're like doing research in this field, 
we're constantly confusing ourselves because people could mean one or the other of those two things or both. Ideally, of course, you know both. That's the perfect situation where you have for E0. But um, in general, you don't know either one of those. And um, so let's talk about how hard it is to find endomorphism rings of, 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 an, of a super singular elliptic curve. So going back to Cole's thesis in 96, um, he essentially said, oh, okay, well, here's a, what we call a generic algorithm, or a, like I talked about yesterday, a square root algorithm for finding endomorphism rings. You just basically walk around the graph until you come back to yourself and you found a cycle. This cycle is now an endomorphism. You started out at E, you ended up at E, it's a map from E to E, it's, it's non-trivial, it's a, it's a non-trivial endomorphism. So if you do this, and you can, if you can do this once, and you can do it twice, and so now you'll presumably have two endomorphisms which uh, generate the endomorphism ring. Um, and so that was kind of his, um, you know, algorithm in his thesis. So unfortunately, that's not exactly um, correct. And so you'll find in the papers of, um, uh, let me see, the Win4 paper of Eisentrager at all. So um, I can't, sorry, I can't remember all the collaborators on that, but that was like Eisentrager, um, Park, and a number of co-authors show that it's only going to generate the endomorphism ring if there isn't um, any common uh, edge in those two cycles that you found. But just assume you found two disjoint cycles and you would actually get the endomorphism ring. Um, and they've also written a follow-up paper on that, which has appeared at ANTS um, this past year. So it's not quite finding the endomorphism ring, but, but it's close. But anyway, it's an exponential time algorithm, right? So it basically um, the birthday par paradox tells you that you will, in square root of the graph size, you know, find find this cycle. So that's good for cryptography in the sense that we don't have the that doesn't break anything because it's still exponential time. Um, and then, so in 2003, I was working on this endomorphism ring finding problem um, with Ken McBur McMurdy. And um, so we wrote down an algorithm was, which was essentially the same algorithm that Servino found at the same time. So you'll find two preprints from about 2003 written independently, which is another way to kind of build up the correspondence of um, endomorphism rings as maximal orders with their uh, the elliptic curves. And that is that you can compute um, in a maximal order, let's say you have, um, you know, sage or magma just spit out a basis for the maximal orders for you. And just take one of those maximal orders with its basis. Now start computing all the elements of norm n for n equals you know, one, two, three, four, et cetera. So you're uh, going through and you could see from the way that the norm form looks, um, it, if you construct the norm from, form from a particular order, it will look slightly different than what I gave you for the general algebra. So, sorry, let me go back a few, few slides um, to this. This is kind of an important point. So here, where I gave you the norm uh, form for the algebra, you can see that if, you know C, D, F, and G are all integers. This is an integer. The norm is an integer, and also it is uh, positive, right? So, because all these things are squared, and P is positive, and so this is all positive. The fact is, though, that if you look at um, the norm form for, let me go to the O0 slide that shows you what O0 is. So even for this nice uh, special extremal order where the basis is one I, one plus K over two, one plus J over two, um, if you uh, kind of work out the description of the norm form, 
um, you'll see that there are denominators. So now the norm is not necessarily um, even an integer. And like I said, integral elements are those that have integral norm and integral, integral trace. But in general, um, it can also be negative because of the way the norm form will look. It doesn't look as nice as it did in the, in the, for the whole algebra. But still, you can um, find a way to basically go through um, all the possibilities and find all the elements in the quaternion algebra that have norm n for small n. So like I said, for one, two, three, four, you know, like that. And those actually correspond to, I mentioned this yesterday in the, in the Q&A, those actually correspond to the, these representation numbers, which are the number of elements of norm n, correspond to the coefficients of the modular form. And the, uh, the thing that I mentioned yesterday is, is that there's a theorem of Serre that says that you um, can determine the order, the order is determined by having square root of P of those coefficients. Okay, so this is also a terrible algorithm. So P is super gigantic of cryptographic size. And now you would need square root of P of these coefficients of the modular form in order to determine the maximum order completely. And that is um, ridiculous. You won't be able to do that in your lifetime. Um, so this is an algorithm which is also exponentially bad. It, it, and it will just compare the number of elements of norm N in a maximal order with the number of isogenies of degree N uh, which are actual endomorphisms. So again, an exponentially bad algorithm, but it's something that you can do for very, very small p, and you can look and you can use this to match up all the maximal orders with all of the um, elliptic curves, and that is actually what's done in practice in a lot of examples in the papers that we have today, um, just to see what the graph looks like and how it corresponds to the graph of, of elliptic curves. So, so far as of today, we have no um, classical sub-exponential algorithms or polynomial time algorithms for finding paths in elliptic curves, and we have no sub-exponential or polynomial time algorithms for finding endomorphism rings of supersingular elliptic curves. So for the future, what you have to think about is, okay, are we going to find any better classical algorithms for the, either of these problems, or even if we're going to find if uh, quantum algorithm experts might find some quantum algorithms for these things. So in order for this to be a good um, candidate for the um, future of post-quantum cryptography, um, you know, both of those problems will continue to need to be studied. In the first lecture on uh, Monday, I mentioned like the four main kind of math candidates that are that were considered in the NIST PQC competition these last um, four years. It's ongoing. It's a five-year competition. I mentioned code-based cryptography, lattice-based cryptography, multivariate crypto cryptography, and um, supersingular isogeny graphs. And for each of them, I put down essentially the date when it was first proposed. And you might have noticed that, like, um, you know, the, all of the others were proposed in the 70s or 80s, essentially, the hard problem was at least. Whereas supersingular isogeny graphs, we proposed in 2005 at the hash function competition. So <clears throat> you're looking at a system which is roughly 15 years old instead of roughly 40 years old, like 30 to 40 years old, at least for the others. And so what NIST did in the third round of the competition is that they uh, specified Psyche, this uh, super singular isogeny key exchange as an alternate candidate um, that's, and stated that it's a candidate that needs um, further study. So good motivation to keep studying and keep working on these, these problems. So it's now an alternate for the final, for the next stage of the comp competition. Okay, so in my last um, 
few minutes, what I wanted to do was to talk about uh, the sig situation for signature schemes based on super singular isogenies. Um, so we ta I talked about cryptographic hash function in the first lecture, talked about key exchange in the second lecture, uh, both based on the hardness of pathfinding. Um, so now uh, we have another system, which is based on the, the hardness of pathfinding. Um, but in 2016, this was proposed by Galbraith, Petit, and Silva, but not really implemented. They didn't find a way to uh, kind of efficiently implement this. And so I wanted to thank Jana for pointing out um, this paper, um, SQI sign, or I guess some people are saying ski sign, from last year, it appeared at Asia Crypt 2020, um, which is uh, kind of a, in some sense, a very variant of the GPS uh, scheme, but they had to improve the KLPT algorithm in order to make this work. So with their improvement of the KLPT algorithm, they proposed um, this signature scheme, which I'm gonna describe to you. Uh, but the, the improvement that they made was they were able to find a quaternionic kind of L, L path finding algorithm from O1 to O2 for two maximal orders O1 and O2 without going to O0. Uh, so for the properties uh, for the zero knowledge properties of the um, of the signature scheme, they didn't uh, they couldn't afford to have to go through O0. So they've improved the KLPT algorithm so that they can go directly from O1 to O2 uh, to maximal orders. Okay, so the setup for their uh, system is again, they're gonna fix some large prime of cryptographic size. Um, there's going to be a um, uh, and a super singular elliptic curve E0, which is one of these special ones, meaning we know what its endomorphism ring is, like extremal endomorphism ring O0. Um, just like my previous slide, you could like if P is congruent to three mod four, then you could take the one that I gave there, um, and then you're going to um, select a an odd smooth num and specify a small prime L as well. You're going to also select an odd uh, smooth number D, which um, has log P bits. So that means um, if you're going to take a, an isogeny of degree D, that it's going to have to be at least, if you translate that into being a walk, it means it's going to have to be a walk of at least essentially the diameter of the graph. So. Um, the key generation is going to be for someone who wants to prove knowledge of uh, something. So this is, I'm going to describe the isogeny scheme. The general signature scheme can be um, obtained from the identification protocol via the fiat Shamir uh, transformation. So a prover want, is going to want to prove knowledge of something. So they're going to prove knowledge of an iso a secret isogeny tau. Um, so what they're going to do is e, is e zero is fixed and known to everyone. Now they're going to take a random walk and isogeny walk and come up with their elliptic curve E a. So this should sound very familiar to you. That's like what we did um, for the hash function. That's like what we did for the first step of the key exchange. Alice and Bob each did this. So they're going to um, publish this elliptic curve E sub A, and the secret is tau, which is the path. And so the public key is gonna be E A and the secret is tau. And now the way that this um, commitment scheme works is that the prover generates a random um, secret isogeny walk from E zero to E one and sends E one to the verifier. Then the verifier sends the description of a cyclic isogeny um, from E1 to E2 of degree D to the prover. Um, so just as an example, it could be like degree D, D could be L to the power log P. That was kind of what I was uh, hinting at in the previous slide. And then um, the response would be um, that from the, I, from since, 
the prover knows tau, prover can um, construct this isogeny um, phi, phi composed with psi composed with um, tau dual, which goes from Ea back to E2. And they, they know that isogeny, sorry. And then they can construct a new isogeny from Ea to E2 of degree D such that phi hat composed with sigma is cyclic and will send sigma uh, to the verifier. Now the verifier will accept if sigma is an isogeny of degree D um, from Ea to E2 and um, phi hat composed with sigma is cyclic and otherwise they will reject it. So I think that's a lot of words, but let me show you the picture that they have of their um, scheme. Hopefully this will make it a little bit easier to understand. So on the left, this dotted arrow going down is the secret key isogeny that I said was um, chosen in the setup. And then the commitment isogeny from the prover is the top uh, solid blue arrow. Um, and then it goes from E0 to E1. The challenge isogeny is the red uh, arrow down from, from the challenger or the verifier. And then um, the response isogeny is that um, you can see since, um, since the prover knows tau and, and tau dual, the prover can construct this thick blue arrow on the bottom because they can go backwards up the tau arrow and then compose, follow the psi arrow and the phi arrow. But if they didn't know, um, if they didn't know tau, then they wouldn't be able to construct the isogeny from um, Ea to E2. And so um, being giving the isogeny sigma, then the verifier can check um, that that has the right properties that were required. So this is uh, a, another very nice uh, application of the super singular isogeny uh, problems. Um, so hopefully I've, it actually kind of turned out that the structure of the lectures turned out a little better than I had even thought in the sense that we did from the cryptographic point of view, we did on the three lectures, we did hash function, key exchange, and then signatures. And then from the kind of mathematical point of view, uh, we talked about um, the description of the super singular isogeny graphs. Also in the second lecture, the, the properties in terms of an expander graph, and specifically a Ramanujan graph. And then um, in the third lecture, we talked about the description of that same graph as a quaternion graph and the hardness of going back and forth between those two descriptions of the graph. So that was uh, pretty good. I've left out a lot, of, a lot of other related topics that I could have included, but I think that that was a good um, set of topics to focus on. I thought I would just share with you, I've put a couple of links for references in the slides, but um, for the quaternions, I actually found what I thought to be um, a bunch of useful uh, recent write-ups of quaternions in English that I will put on. I'll add another slide, which I'll, I'll add to the slides um, before sending them today. And um, so I just wanted to end by, um, talking about some of the other graphs that have been investigated and some of the other ongoing work in this field. So this is just, I guess I'm like a minute or two over, but I, just to end with some of the other things. So um, in our original paper, uh, the uh, cryptographic hash functions from expander graphs, the CGL paper from 2006, uh, we also proposed other expander graphs, for example, the LPS, uh, graphs, which are very simple because they can, they are Cayley graphs in basically SL2 FP. But um, cycles were found very quickly in those graphs. An algorithm for finding cycles was found by Zemmer and Tillich and in 2008 at Eurocrypt. And uh, also that same year in 2008, we extended their algorithm um, with, with Petit and Kiskate to find pre images. Um, so those graphs are broken from the cryptographic point of view. 
Um, but an interesting thing is that the algorithm that we gave for path founding, finding in those graphs is now being used. It was kind of rediscovered in the setting of um, quantum arithmetic, and it's now being used as a way to do um, efficient uh, quantum arith arithmetic with us for certain quantum in infrastructures. Um, so even though the LPS graphs are essentially broken, there are um, variations that you can take of them that are not yet broken. Um, so the Morgan Stern graph, I've mentioned the higher dimensional analogs um, that we proposed in 2007. Um, but zooming forward now, you know, almost 15 years, um, there's a lot of ongoing work. So other alternate graphs that were have been considered are like the, the seaside graph, um, dimension two analogs, signatures that I've mentioned here and other variants. Um, ongoing work on attacks, like uh, Petit has an attack that works uh, by using extra, the extra information from the um, knowledge of the images of the uh, torsion points in the key exchange. Um, there's ongoing work on understanding the graph structure better. Um, so uh, Adventures in Super Singularland paper with um, Jana and uh, Sarah Arpin and um, or other co-authors from last year investigating more the structure of the graph and the relationship between the ordinary um, volcanoes, isogeny graphs, which are volcanoes, and how they embed into the, um, the graph structure for super singular isogeny graphs. So sorry for going a couple minutes over time. This is just to give you an idea of a large amount of kind of ongoing work in this, in this area. A lot of other people that are probably not mentioned on this slide. So sorry about that if I didn't put your name here. So thank you very much for your attention. It's been fun talking with you. Be happy to answer questions if we have time. All right, well, let's start by thanking Kristen for her very nice lecture. Um, and I don't see anything in the chat, but if there are further questions, um, we should ask Kristen now. So Enrique has a question, Kristen. In the chat or? Oh, um, are there implementations of KLPT? Yeah, in the chat. Uh, yes and no. Um, so there were definitely experiments in the original KLPT paper, which indicated the um, feasibility and the confirmed like the heuristic analysis of the algorithm. Um, but um, actually not exactly sure how to say this. There's a paper under confidential re review for MathCrypt, which has a, which has an implementation. Um, I can't remember if it's on ePrint already or not. So that's why, <laughs> but it will be public soon. It should literally be public like within uh, two or three weeks, if not. Um, so that's that's the other one that I know of. I'm thinking that the SQ sign paper may have an implementation even of their better algorithm, which kind of didn't know about until Jana pointed that paper out to me. So. Yana, I don't know whether you know, do you know if they have an implementation um, public for ski sign? Uh, yes, I can uh, link the GitHub repository in chat. So yeah, so they do have an implementation for their algorithm available? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So I would say that's even better. Are there other questions? All right, I'm not seeing, oh, I just saw one in chat. <laughs> um, this one's pretty long. Um, Kristen, do you want to read it? Are you able to access the chat? Oh yeah, oh, this is a really good question. This is a really big sticking point in my opinion. So um, yeah, this is kind of interesting. 
Okay, so I mentioned how, how you can generate a super singular elliptic curve. I think that Jana was planning in the, in the TA sessions to talk about another easier way to generate a super singular elliptic curve. And that is um, if the prime is such that like, for example, P congruent to three mod four, where we know a super singular elliptic curve, it's sitting right there in front of us. Um, there's that one, that's a super singular elliptic curve. But if you wanna hash, you have some bit string and you wanna hash into the set of super singular elliptic curves. So you wanna come up with some other super singular elliptic curve based on your bit string, you can do basically like we do in the hash function, which is just to walk from the starting point. And now you end up somewhere. So that's, you know, that's one way to do it. And that's an excellent way to do it, but there's a problem. And that is that it leads to the possibility of a trap door. So that's what we actually wrote about this in our 2018 Eurocrypt paper with um, Petit and Eisentrager, Hallgren and Morrison, that um, if somebody knows that secret path and they uh, now give you a super singular elliptic curve as if it were some random thing, but they know that path, then they have information which connects them back to that curve that even you know, without KLPT, because you don't have to, you're not in the quaternion side, they know a path that goes back to the super singular elliptic curve where you know the endomorphism ring. And then they can kind of drag it. We have an algorithm for kind of dragging it along so you can break things. So if you generate super sing, if you rely on that approach to generate super singular elliptic curves then you will be subject to the possibility of this kind of backdoor, backdoor attack. So instead, the kind of theoretical thing that I mentioned, which is, is that you take um, a random, could be a large imaginary quadratic field where P is inert, but it can't be that large because you need to be able to compute the Hilbert class polynomial. And the Hilbert class polynomials are exponentially large. Um, uh, although if you use our kind of explicit CRT approach, you can um, generate those Hilbert class polynomials directly over FP without computing them first with the coefficients in Z. But if you do that, then it's true. So you know, um, so you've taken a root of this Hilbert class polynomial uh, to be the J invariant. And so now you know that that particular super singular elliptic curve, you know, has CM by that imaginary quadratic field. Um, and that could be, there is ongoing work looking at the extent to which that can be, um, that could be problematic. It's, um, some people call it a, an orientation that you know on the, on the curve, so. It's possible that that could be a problem. All right, thanks, Kristen. Um, and yes. Eric has a follow up. So it is related. Okay, great. Um, all right, so I think um, that's all the time we have for today. Um, let's thank Kristen for her wonderful lecture series this week. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everyone. And a big thanks to Yana, who's done a fantastic job on the exercises and the, leading the TA session, too. So.